Hello again, everybody. I'm Scott Casper, along with my partner, Tony Hager. This is Global Wrestling News. Here now, our top story of the week. The 50th annual NWCA All-Star Classic took place in Atlanta, Tony, and the event featured some of the top performers from last year competing under some new rules, including a stalling criteria and a four-point near fall, as well as my favorite, the experimental three-point takedown. Exhibition started with an NCAA Finals rematch at 125. The returning champ, Nathan Tomasello, and West Virginia rival, Zeke Moisey. It was Tomasello who struck early, locking up a takedown and a cradle in the first. He was unable to finish the turn, but added the second period takedown and a riding time point for an easy 7-1 victory. You know, Tomasello was in control from their feet, from the top position. You know, he's the early favorite, I think, on paper. But Nico Mega Lutus, he is hungry. He's sitting in that 2-3 spot. You know, he, he's my pick to win at 125 pounds this year. Now we go to 133, Tony. And after trading escapes, Michigan's Rossi Bruno picked up a 4-1 decision in sudden victory over Lehigh's Mason Beckman. Is this an upset, or is Bruno just that good? You know, Michigan has a lot of buzz around them right now, and Bruno is a big part of that. You know, upset, you could say on paper, but these two really could flip-flop in the rankings throughout the season, I think. Easily the most entertaining bout of the night, 141 pounds. It was a classic bedlam bout. We're going to see it. These two guys will match up head-to-head -head several times throughout this year. And I'll tell you what, wrestling fans, you're not going to want to miss any one of them. I think this one was stellar. Yeah, Cody Brewer ended up uh, you know, taking the lead right away, 3-1 to one after the first period. Uh, but uh, Dean Heil came back, turned it up in the second, scoring a pair of takedowns. Had a, real, a lot of good counters, carried 7-4 lead into the third. Well, Brewer get within a point on a reversal, but Heil scored four with an escape and a takedown. Just a minute 15 left to go, up 11-6. Well, Brewer wasn't done yet. He worked his way off the mat and hit a pair of takedowns for an incredible 13-12 victory. What do you think? Brewer at 141? I like Brewer at any weight class, but uh, you know I think this was a good test for him and his coaches. You know he had a he had a tougher time finishing his shots at 141 than at 133. Could be the size difference. You know uh, he, he just seems like he can take people down at will at 133. You know I think uh, it just comes down to for him, what's the struggle like cutting down to 133? You know how, does he feel good? After that match, after seeing how much excitement he had coming back for that victory, I think he, he feels good real, at 141. We go to 149, Riders B.J. Clegg and topped Old Dominion's Alexander Richardson 9-6. You know, this, this match could have gone either way. You know, Clegg on, he won uh, the key scrambles to come away with the victory here. It was Lehigh's Mitchell Minotti who picked up a victory over South Dakota State's Cody Pack at 157. Were you surprised by this one? You know, if you didn't see the match and just looked at the results, it was misleading. Uh, Pack was pinned in the overtime match in a defensive position. You know, he, he was in trouble either way, so he probably would have gave up the takedown. You know, Pack's conditioning, I think, has been in question in the past, and I think he looked really, really good for, you know, late October, early November. So I'm excited for him to, to be back uh, with South Dakota State this year. Well, NC State's Max Roscoff picked up an easy 9-2 decision at 165. That, of course, over Oklahoma's Clark Glass. The bout was scheduled just days prior after North Carolina's Ethan Ramos and Oklahoma State's Alex Derringer both pulled out of the event. Now we'll quickly go through the balance of the weights here. 74, the first time we saw the new stalling routes became a big factor there as Virginia Tech's Zach Epperly eked past Oklahoma State's Kyle Crutchmer 2-1. This was uh, this is where the new rules came into play, and just really was disappointed. A double stall for interlocking fingers. And, you know, this is an all-star event, and it has to come down to this. I mean, th this seriously needs to get looked at prior to the season because wrestlers and coaches are are going to take advantage of that. If you both, if one person's been dinged for stalling. One guy can come up there, interlock the fingers, and there's going to be double stalling. So now that guy is going to be given another point for the stalling. That could be a deciding factor in multiple matches. So um, I don't think that we should have matches decided by interlocking the fingers. Arizona State's Blake Stauffer scored a counter takedown and sudden victory to top Lehigh's Nathaniel Brown 4-1. That, of course, at 84. Stauffer came in as a late replacement for All-American Vic Avery and went from the undercard to earning one of the event's two most valuable wrestler awards. You know, they have something cooking out there at Arizona State, and it'll be interesting to see what Zeke Jones does with his red shirts. I mean, we talked about it, this on Takedown Radio, and he says he's going to put the best uh, wrestlers on the map, but, uh, 
you know, it, he's prepping for the future, I think, and, and that's what, uh, you know, Zeke Jones needs to do. Connor Hartman made history Sunday night when he became the first Duke Blue Devil ever to compete at the event. He also picked up the school's first victory with an easy 8-1 win over Michigan All-American Max Huntley. I think it's always good to see, you know, these type of schools, Duke being showcased, you know, they are known for basketball, and so anytime, you know, a, a non-wrestling fan sees, hey, there's Duke, and not, you know, the, the Big 12, the Big 10 schools, I think that's a good, uh, good vision for our sport, possibly for the future. Well, the final bout of the night, the heavyweights, it was a big upset? I don't know. Virginia Tech's high walls looked awfully, awfully good as he knocked off Returning NCAA runner-up Adam Kuhn, the score was 9-3. Walls went up big early, finishing a single leg and scoring three points and two near fall in the process. Tony, are you concerned by Kuhn's performance or have we underestimated Ty Walls? I think a lot of people have underestimated Walls' ability. I mean, he showed up to battle right off the, right off the bat. And he was rewarded for that aggressiveness. You know, Kuhn just had a real tough time passing his hands to get to Walt's legs. And, you know, that was the deciding factor. I mean, maybe maybe Kuhn has peaked already. I don't know if he's peaked already. I think this Ty Walsh is all jacked up. I mean, my God, he looked good. Well, the new rule is obviously a major factor in Atlanta. We'll get John Smith's opinion. That's after the break. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back to the show. John Smith is starting his 25th year in Stillwater, and he's got the Cowboys ranked in the top three. He joins us now to talk a little OSU wrestling. Coach, congratulations on 100 years of Cowboy wrestling and your 25th. Thanks, Scott. You know, it is an exciting time for us. I mean, we think of 100 years uh, in America and anything is, is a long time. And, um, you know, I'm just pretty fortunate that... Um, you know, Coach Gallagher and the athletic directors over the time really, re really laid a foundation that uh, allowed us to to have the success that we've had as a team over these hundred years. And you know, I think a lot of times we think it's coaches and athletes that uh, uh, that win and lose, but uh, really, it's a, it's it is about administrators. It, it is it's about that help behind the scenes that that creates an environment for you to to give you a chance to be really successful. And I think. You know, if I look back on the 100 years, and of course I've been a, a part of that uh, for, for over 30 years as a student athlete and as a coach, uh, you know, we've, we've just always had that, the support that uh, a great program needs and, and the funding as well as uh, uh, just the moral support. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, it's a privilege to be the, be the coach of a program that uh, is successful as Oklahoma State uh, in its 100th year. Well, John, you've got some freshmen that could make the lineup at 133. Do you plan on giving a shot or redshirting them no matter what? Well, I think, you know, we're going to go into the season and, you know, uh, with the idea that uh, try to put our very best team on the mat and, and give ourselves uh, an opportunity to be, uh, be competitive enough to, to maybe challenge for an NCAA championship at the end. So, uh, I don't think we cannot put our best guys on the mat and really see ourselves in that position. So we'll, we'll put the best guys, whether they're redshirted freshmen uh, or, or, excuse me, not redshirted freshmen, whether they're true freshmen or not. Um, I think at 133, I think I've got some really good kids there right now. They're very dedicated. They're, they're training well. Um, but they're really not in the picture right now um, until they get a chance to show that they are. Um, they're not. Um, uh, you know, we, we had a, uh, an event last week, and, and um, Crutchmer ended up winning the, the, the tournament that we were in, and, and Garcia took second, and uh, Harding ended up third, who was our starter last year. So it's going to need to play out, but, but I do believe that when these guys get a chance, I think that we could have one of those three emerge. I'd like to keep K. Brock along with Boo Llewellyn, and redshirt Boo Llewellyn broke his ankle, so we won't see Boo this season uh, as a starter. But uh, K. Brock, uh, he's a winner. You know, he's he's trained right here in Stillwater over over most of his career, if not all of his career, and kind of learned how to train uh, properly. And and he's got a great attitude towards winning. So uh, the weight is as confusing to me as it is you. So 
Um, let's hope that we have somebody to emerge out of this way because this is a weight class that we need. Obviously, John Rules, big topic during the preseason. What were your initial thoughts on the All-Star Classic and the three-point takedown? Well, I just think that, you know, I mean, I've got my own opinion about things, and, and it's just one opinion. Um, to me, with the rules that they implemented, they're saying we don't want these athletes on the mat as much. Um, if that's where if that's where they want to go with it, and they think that's very important, you know, I think sometimes coaches don't need to be in involved with with changing of rules. I think because we have a tendency to to look at our own team and think what what our team needs. Um, and I know Jeff Swenson um, from Augsburg, who been a big part of the, the NCAA committee. Uh, you know, he, he's made some pretty pretty bold moves without total consent from coaches, and I really support them to continue to do that. Um, do what you think, you know, because I think a lot of times our opinions are biased, and we try not to be biased. I think we, we all want what's best for the sport, but sometimes it's really difficult to, to, to get past your own individuals on your team. So... I'm excited about what they did. Do I like everything? No, but I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go with them. Let's, let's do this on a yearly basis and, and, and continue to, you know, not do maybe what Fila had done in the past <clears throat> where so many of the rule changes were just so drastic and, and goofy um, that it kind of, you know, it kind of depleted our wrestling for, for almost 12 years where you just didn't see a lot of development. Um, and you saw what, what, what's happened in the last couple of years since our return back to the Olympics. Um, I just witnessed the, probably the best world championships I ever watched. Um, I saw new skill. I saw innovative skill. I saw things that got me really excited about coaching. Um, and, you know, I think anyone that went to that championship and, and watched them, um, uh, watch that championship you walk away going you know I walked away going I'm sure glad I didn't have to wrestle today in this world you know <laughs> so um, that's what it's about you know that's what rule change rule, rule changes should do is is get people excited you know that I like what I see the three-point takedown I like it but I, I'd much rather see a three-point takedown being the first takedown of the match, and then everything switching back to two. We, we want to avoid those zero-zero first periods, so let's make the first takedown three points, and I think that we, we'll see a little bit more energy, and, and maybe we wouldn't. I don't know. Maybe we wouldn't, but it just seems like three-point takedowns and, uh, against one-point escapes, um, you know, if you don't want us on the mat, then then that's the way we need to go, and and, and maybe they maybe it's something that uh, that we do need to go to. Hey, congratulations, John, on the new Nike deal. We appreciate our good friends at Nike helping to make this interview possible. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, guys. We'll take a quick time out. Global wrestling news continues, and Hollywood Wayne Boyd is next. Thank you. All right, welcome back. Usually you find Wayne Boyd on the West Coast, but today he's out east getting ready for the Bill Farrell International in New York. From the New York Athletic Club, here's Hollywood Wayne Boyd with this week's edition of As I See It. Hi, I'm Wayne Boyd for Global Wrestling News. We're at the New York AC in the most famous wrestling room in all of the United States. Some of the greatest wrestlers in the world have trained here in this wrestling room. And this weekend, the New York AC Tournament, the traditional New York AC Tournament, will be held. Known now as the Bill Farrell International Tournament. And Russia is here and Japan is here. And this is going to be a great event. And I can tell you, Titan Mercury Wrestling Club is coming in force to try and win this event. The greatest of the greats 
have wrestled in this room. Dave Schultz, Bruce Baumgartner, the great Dan Gable, and so many more, starting back with George Maynard in as early as 1904, who was our first two-time Olympic champion, 1904 and 1908. The great Doug Blueball, they've won so many plaques here. There's so much history in this room. And the great Doug Blueball, 1960 Olympic champion, who pinned Habibi of Iran. Wayne Wells was here. The Peterson brothers. The band Brands brothers. Everyone, Cale Sanderson, Henry Cejudo, Brandon Slay, they all trained here over the years. One of the greatest was Henry Wittenberg. Henry Wittenberg won over 300 matches without defeat, was the 1948 Olympic champion, made a comeback in 52 to make the team and become a silver medalist in his second Olympics. This room has been heralded with the greatest wrestlers in American history. Bill Smith, Danny Hodge, they go on and on and on. The names that came to this room to become great and be great. Wayne Boyd for Global Wrestling News. Scott, back to you. The Bill Farrow will also serve as an Olympic qualifying event. A lot of things on the line there. Athletes in competition all looking to make their mark. Make sure to tune in next week for a look back at all the action from Manhattan. Wrestling fans, a lot more to talk about. Stay tuned. You're watching Global Wrestling News. Well, the college season starts with a big duel this weekend between number 13 ranked Iowa State and the number 6 ranked Virginia Tech Hokies. What's the biggest match in this duel, your opinion? All of them are important because last season Iowa State upset Virginia Tech 21-12. to Iowa State is without some key players because of disciplinary issues off the mat. So the key matchup will be Leland Weatherspoon against number 4 Zach Epperly. Weatherspoon's ranking does not reflect his ability because this will be the first time that we see him at 174 pounds, Scott. You know, this will be definitely the highlight bout of the night. All right, prediction, final score. You go first. Similar score to last year, but you know, this year I think we'll see the Hokies out on top, 23 to 12. You know, once Moreno, Harrington, and Downing get in the lineup, I think we'll we'll see a different outcome. See them at their full strength. So if this was dual happen in January, I think we'll have a real tight bout with Iowa State squeaking out a win. I've got 17-17, no clear cut winner. What are your thoughts on Arizona State versus West Virginia? The Mountaineers well, won this matchup last season. Will it be the same this time around? Uh, you know, we don't know a lot about right. these teams. Right. You know, uh, Zeke Jones told us on Takedown Radio that he, he's going to put the best team out there on the map. But you know, does that team include you know his his star freshman? It would be interesting to see who he throws out on the mat well, this weekend. Here's an example: Blake Stafford just beat an NCAA finalist at the All Star Classic. Is he a title contender at 84? You know, Nathaniel Brown, Vic Avery, Gabe Dean, you know, and then now Stoffer. I mean, all are contenders, but Gabe Dean, in my eyes, is above all of them right now, and it, he is the early favorite. Well, a team that's looking to fill a lot of holes in their lineup, the Gophers of Minnesota. They're in the top 25. We had Jay Robinson on the program Saturday. Here's what he had to say about his squad. We're excited. we got a young team, and um, we got some holes that we had to fill, and we had some... Uh, Guys that have been around, but we've got guys with some uh, experience in six of the ten weights. So we're, we're excited to see uh, how we're going to do and how they're going to progress through the season. We've told everybody um, to be ready to wrestle. Um, using Ethan uh, Lysak as an example, is he asked me, uh, am I going to wrestle this year, coach, or am I going to redshirt? And, and, I, and I told Ethan this. I said, last year, I said, we pulled you out in the end of uh, uh, January. And I said, Ethan, if I told you at the beginning of the year when you came in um, that you were going to wrestle this year, would you have trained different? And Ethan said, yeah, I would have. And I said, therein lies the fact is that you're going to wrestle this year. And same with the freshmen. I've told them all is that we're going to put the best team out. Um, we're going to look at it from a lot of different angles, not just the winning and losing it. 
how it fits together uh, emotionally and how guys uh, motivate each other. And, and it's also involved in what do we have for the future and what do we need to do to prepare to be. So, you know, I laughingly tell people, I said, you know, when I came here, Minnesota was 34th, and now I think we're 28th. So I'm I, 30 years, I've got about five places, so I'm doing okay. If you wrestle for a Big Ten team, you have to be ready at all times. I mean, this conference is so tough that, you know, having an off year can affect your recruiting for many years. And J-Rob, we all know that he's one of the best at recruiting, so he's going to do what's best for, I think, recruiting and his team. Predictions, is there any freshmen that are going to be making the lineup? Be interested to see the matches in the room between Jake Short and Freddie Stoker. I mean, personally, right now, I think I would lean towards redshirting everyone, everyone. based off what I saw. Yeah, everyone. You know, Big Ten has some great teams there this season, and I just don't think throwing true freshmen in the lineup gains a whole lot. i got to tell you, I'd be careful if I were you. I'll put a red shirt on you and do the show by myself. <laughs> well, it's kind of been an exciting season for sure, fans. And, of course, we're going to recap a lot of these duels on next week's show. Unfortunately, Tony, we're out of time. So for our executive producer, Andrew Barth, for Wayne Boyd and Tony Hager, I'm Scott Casper. We'll see you next week right here on Global Wrestling News.